Hey everyone, it's Darren DeVivo, and welcome to another of Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly podcast about the Beatles, anything and everything about the Beatles, together and solo, and all things Beatles-related as well. I am Darren DeVivo, I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. Uh, WFUV is a non-commercial public radio station, broadcasting at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2, and you can also listen to WFUV anywhere. Uh, at WFUV.org and on our app. And I've been part of WFUV on the air for the past 37 years. And here I am every other week, give or take, on things we said today, along with my good friends, my co-hosts. Let me introduce you to Ken Michaels, a longtime broadcaster who has dedicated virtually his entire 40-year career to hosting Beatle-oriented programs. In fact, it's been 39 years of Beatles broadcasting for Ken. He spent some time at XM, currently hosts the syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing, the video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. How are you, Ken? I am fine, Darren. Hello to all of our fab listeners. And then there's my friend Alan Kozin, the acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic who spent nearly 40 years at the New York Times, where he was a classical music critic and manned at the Beatles desk. Through the decades, Alan has contributed to countless publications, and these days you can read his stuff in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Highlights for Children. Wait, who put that in? <laughs> um, Alan, has, uh, Alan has written Golf Digest? No, I'm just kidding. Alan has written numerous books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and Numerous books covering a variety of topics, including classical music. How are you, Alan? I'm fine, Darren, and hello, everyone. All right, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Our next show is going to be all about... No, I'm kidding. Uh, Now that the introductions are out of the way, our topic coming up later is going to be the new Paul McCartney remix album, McCartney 3 Imagined. But first, it's time for news, so I'm going to throw it at Ken. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Since last week, another new video to promote the new Plastic on All Band box set premiered on YouTube, and that's the demo for Give Peace a Chance. It has John performing it on acoustic guitar at the Sheridan Oceanus Hotel in the Bahamas in 1969 on a couch with Yoko. And John is ad-libbing most of the lyrics of the verses. Picture quality is excellent. A real nice treat. And the audio recording for this is actually part of the Blu-ray audio of the box set, which is due out this Friday. Paul McCartney has been live on Instagram having very casual conversations with artists who were involved in the new mixes of songs for the new uh, McCartney 3 Imagine release, which came out digitally last Friday. Going on sometimes up to 30 minutes to let you know what's going on with him, also making appearances to promote the new McCartney 3 Imagine release. And last Thursday, he spoke with both Ed O'Brien of the band Radiohead and Annie Clark of St. Vincent. In these interviews, he hinted that he was going to Charlie Chaplin Studios to lay down a track with a young producer, Andrew Watt, who uh, won the Grammy Award for Producer of the Year just recently. Some of the acts he's produced have been Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus, Ozzy Osbourne, and Charlotte Lawrence. He said this new track that he's been working on is not for the next album, just doing it to see what happens. He also said he was in town, this was in L.A., to work on his animated film for High in the Clouds, and that he had plans that night to watch the first bit of the Get Back movie with Ringo. And Paul also did an interview with Phoebe Bridgers and Josh Homme last Friday. Either of you see any of these interviews? I've seen bits of all four of them. haven't watched all four complete yet. Probably the most I watched was Phoebe Bridgers because I like her track the best. But um, yeah, you know, they're, they're charming, as, as I think you said. Very laid back and, you know, okay, so, so what have you been doing? Well, this is what I've been doing. And, uh, you know, a little bit of um, 
artist talk, a little bit of family talk, you know, it's, 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 it's actually sort of like eavesdropping on someone's, uh, you know, FaceTime call. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's, it's very casual. And, um, you know, it could be something as simple as talking about the weather or how much they like dogs, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. not just about their work. So, yeah. Yeah, and at least two of it. them have their kids in it as well. Um, Ed O'Brien uh, from Radiohead does, and his, his daughter, who's like a teenager. And the other was Josh Hobby, who's uh, had a, a one young kid doing math homework in the background. And then an, an even younger kid comes by just to say hello for a while. But uh, yeah, very homey. I, I, I got to watch these because I enjoyed... I jumped around the Ed O'Brien interview because uh, I'm a fan of Radiohead. And I didn't know St. Vincent interviewed him as well, uh, interviewed Paul as well. But I was jumping around listening to pieces of the Ed O'Brien interview. And I prefer those type interviews sometimes. Occasionally, the conversation starts to get boring. But that's where you really seem to get a, get some, some substance out of them as opposed to these appearances on television like when Jimmy Fallon, you know, becomes a fanboy. Uh, with mm. McCartney on on TV, you know, so uh, yeah. I definitely uh, I definitely want to check these all out. Like I said, I've only seen parts of the Ed O'Brien uh, Phoebe, interview. Phoebe Bridgers before hers um, tweeted, uh, "I'm going to be talking to Paul McCartney on Instagram at two thirty. I hope I remember how to say words." <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny you said that Josh Homme's son was doing math while this is going on. Mm -hmm. His father's talking to Paul McCartney. <laughs> He's doing homework. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would kind of I would cancel what I was doing there and just focus on this, talking to Paul. But mm. hey, this is reality. More news. Paul is featured in the latest issue of Mojo Magazine with Paul Weller on the front cover. The headline quote from Paul, from Paul McCartney, reads, Come on, man. We were hippies. Paul Weller apparently is the new editor from Mojo. Both former Wings members Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber were due to be part of a Q&A hosted by Q104's Ken Dashow this past Saturday as a virtual event in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the formation of Wings. An article appeared in uh, New York's Daily News with quotes from both Denny and Lawrence on how Wings deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and how they will never reform without Linda McCartney. Denny was quoted as saying, it was not Paul's band. It was a band called Wings. That's exactly what Paul wanted of us. We were in on everything. And Juber said that Paul viewed Wings' successes as a collective effort. He's quoted as saying, we were encouraged to think of it as a band. It wasn't just Paul McCartney's backing group. Then he said he'd love to drum with Paul again and told him so, but Paul made it clear that a Wings reunion wouldn't be right without Linda. Then he says, right after Linda passed away, I went over to Paul in England and we talked about a Wings reunion and he had me get together with some of the guys, get their contact information and see if anybody was interested. When I called him back and said, yeah, it's a go. Let's see what we can do here. He said, on second thought, having a reunion without Linda in the band would be like having a Beatles reunion without John Lennon. And Lawrence said that when Wingspan was released in 2001, Paul said to him, there would be no wing shows without Linda. Lawrence is quoted as saying she was integral to the band. As much as all the flack she got, she was the core of it, at least in my experience. Interesting quotes right there. You guys want to chime in on this? Well, you know, he's, uh, Lawrence Juber said things like that to us one of the times we interviewed him um, mm -hmm. the f several years ago. Um, so it, it doesn't surprise me that, that he still feels that way. You know? Yeah, I've interviewed Lawrence many times and Denny Sywell, and they said words to the, to the same effect, mm -hmm. just talking about how involved all the band members were in the, cr the creative side of Wings, even... Um, in deciding what the, the songs were picked for the Red Rose Speedway album. That was a band decision. So, you know, there's collaboration of all kinds that you can have in a group. And it was more than just, you know, the parts that they played on, on the songs. And in many cases, they were ideas that came from the band members themselves. It wasn't just all dictated by Paul. 
Denny Lane says, however, that none of them had any input into which songs got onto Red Rose Speedway and which ones didn't. He he didn't know until he heard the album that uh, what was it? I would only smile. I think was supposed to be on it. Mm-hmm. That it wasn't going to be. Um, he said that was really just between Paul and EMI and the the rest of them sort of weren't in that side of the business. They just played, you know, he, he did the rest that that was, I mean, that's what Denny Lane says uh, with right. wings players. Often, if you talk to more than one of them, you get different points of view. Absolutely. And that's how you learn as much as you can about what it was really like. But I know consistently Denny Sywell has said this to me about being in wings mm-hmm. and, you know, it was a very enjoyable experience for him and the biggest regret of his career was leaving wings yeah but um yeah but you learn from the people that actually worked with paul and actually a few years ago when the moody blues were inducted into the rock and roll of fame danny lane was quoted as saying that wings was paul's backup band Mm -hmm. so and yet at the same time i've interviewed danny lane and he's told me that paul was always encouraging him to write material for the group you know, so it wasn't like it was all Paul's show. So you got to listen to what they all had to say and then form your yeah. own opinion. It's probably a little bit of everything, mm. you know, because then, of course, didn't uh, wasn't uh, Henry McCullough's beefs when he left was that it, Paul pretty much controlled the show. And uh, when it came time for him to play a solo or do something that he, you know, uh, Paul sort of wanted it done a certain way that doesn't sound like a democracy yet Denny well, that, Sy- Lawrence that, Huber spoke differently yeah well the, the main beef with Henry was the solo on my love which Paul praised he thought it was one of the greatest solos but the downside of that was that Paul always wanted him to play it the same way and mm-hmm. that's not what Henry wanted right. to do he wanted mm-hmm. to do instinctively what came to him as he was playing it live right so um yeah but like I said, get as much information as you can with all the people that worked with Paul, and then you'll get a you know a fuller picture of it all. Right. But for many years, it's not like they just come out and said this. Denny Sywell has been saying this to me for years, as has Lawrence Juber, and also saying that there's a huge difference between a band like Wings and, say, what Paul has had the last 20 years. Well, something you just said, you said that the, because I wanted to, to watch it but didn't, uh, you said that the Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber uh, event this past weekend, you, the way you worded it, it didn't come off or it did come off? As far as I know, it did happen. I didn't get oh, to okay. see it, though. Yeah. These are just quotes that were a, se- a separate interview that the, the right. Daily News did. Right. Yeah. And I agree. I've been saying Wing should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a separate band. And... Um, and there's a, a Ram tribute album, right? That's just weeks away that Denny Sywell sort of at the center of. Right. It's coming out May 14th. It's called Ram On. And um, also uh, David Spinoza plays on some of the songs. And so does Marvin Stamm, who played the trumpet or the flugelhorn on Uncle Albert. And uh, a lot of great musicians all throughout. In fact, I was going to mention this at the end of the show. But on my new YouTube channel, I just interviewed Denny Sywell and Fernando Perdomo, who both co-produced the new uh, Ram on Tribute. So it's a lot about that and um, the whole process of how it all came together. And it was all done, obviously, in lockdown without bands in the same studio together. Everybody had to bring in their parts and send it to them digitally. Right. So it's really interesting how it all came together. It sounds fantastic. I have. I have uh, downloads of it so far, but it's coming out on CD and digitally on May the 14th. So, yeah, you've got that and you've got this McCartney three imagined and the plastic on all band box set. So there's quite a lot there to chew on for Beatle fans right now. Also, Ringo Starr posted a photo on Friday of an octopus on a seabed with a caption that read the octopus's garden is threatened. Will you help protect it? He sent the message reading, I am asking for your help to save the oceans from my friends, the octopuses. Peace and love with a hashtag for Greenpeace International. With special thanks to one of our listeners, Rob Nataro and Ultimate Classic Rock, 
News comes that the actor Jacob Fortune Lloyd, who played chess prodigy and journalist D.L. Towns in The Queen's Gambit, has been chosen to play the lead role in a biopic on Brian Epstein called Midas Man, which begins shooting later this year. This unofficial film, which has been in production for quite some time on the life and times of the Beatles manager, will be directed by multi-Grammy winner Jonas Ackerland, best known for music videos, including Ozzy Osbourne's Under the Graveyard. Fortune Lloyd had this to say, it's a huge privilege to play Brian Epstein, a man who made such an important and lasting cultural impact, but who struggled to find a secure place in a world he helped to shape. Fortune Lloyd said during a media announcement, he was a fascinating person with great talent, ambition, and courage, and I'm so honored to be given the opportunity to represent him. Jonas is the perfect person to bring the story to life. His work is visually stunning, visceral, and bold. I can't wait to start working together. And Ackerland said, it is a tall order to fill Brian's shoes, and Jacob is the perfect performer. He is charismatic and dark at the same time, balancing that emotional range when you're not sure if you're in love with him or terribly empathetic with the inner turmoil of his character. No one could bring Brian to life better. This should be interesting. You're always hearing about projects about Brian Epstein, and eventually they do come out. We know about the Vectuari's uh, plans of having a, a mini TV series on Brian. Uncut Magazine is reporting that two electronic instrumental recordings that George Martin made in the early 60s under the pseudonym Ray Cathode are about to be reissued. This is in collaboration with BBC Radiophonic Workshop's Madalena Fagandini. The songs Time Beat and Waltz in Orbit were released in April 1962 as a single on Parlophone Records right before Martin met the Beatles. They're going to be reissued on May the 1st as a limited run of 100 12-inch vinyl EPs. They are sold exclusively by Dublab, with all proceeds benefiting Dublab's nonprofit community radio programming and mission. They're sold it, out. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to get them over the weekend. And they're gone. Yeah, I ordered but one. You, I ordered one when it was first announced. It, it's it's interesting. They were only twenty five dollars. It wasn't you know for something that's a limited edition that I thought was pretty low. Right. Mm. You can listen to those two instrumentals on YouTube. If you're mm -hmm. curious to know, I mean, George Martin, I believe, wrote these two instrumentals. I actually, when I was looking to buy the reissue, the single that we just mentioned, I actually found an original on. On eBay, which was not that expensive at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy it. I should have. But I think they're both also, or at least one of them. But I, I think both of them are also on that um, George Martin box set. Uh, it's like a five or six CD right. set that came out years ago. I can't remember right. the title of it, but mm. yeah. Okay. All right. With special thanks to John Bazzini of the always excellent Beatles in Print Together and Solo Facebook page, we learn of a new book called Rivals of the Beatles by Martin Orkin. It's described on the book's page as a trawl through history's greatest era of 20 of the many fine groups who rivaled the Beatles almost. Featured are the Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, the Birds, and the Kinks. It's made in glossy hardback, has 800 pages of informative text, and there is an initial print run of 500 numbered and signed copies available. To purchase the book, just go to rivalsofthebeatles.com. And finally, Cherry Red Records, the same company that's putting out the tribute album to Ram called Ram On on May 14th, and also reissued Mike McCartney's McGear album, will be releasing a five-CD box set called Good as Gold, Artifacts of the Apple Era, 1967 through 1975. It includes some previously released and many unreleased songs from this period from artists that the Beatles company Apple were interested in, who in fact were offered studio time at demo facilities. This includes artists and songwriters from across the musical spectrum with a wealth of familiar names and lesser known artists, most of whom were handpicked by the Beatles and their inner circle. It's described as a fascinating and insightful peek into the minds and tastes of those behind the company and a broad snapshot of those who hoped to catch their attention. 
Familiar names would include artists like Grapefruit, Jackie Lomax, Forrest, Tim Harden, Tucker and Lyle, and Steeler's Wheel. Many of these songs are available on a previous release called 94 Baker Street, the pop psych sounds of the Apple era, 1967 through 1969, on Granados Records. This new release is due out June the 25th. If you've always wanted to hear Brute Force's um, King of Fa, here's your opportunity. (laughs) Okay, the name of it again is called Good As Gold, Artifacts of the Apple Era, 1967 to 1975. And there you go. That's all the news I have for you this time. No more news? That's it. Okay, that's good there, Ken. Lots of news. (laughs) Now on to the meat and potatoes of the show. Uh, The brand new uh, album, McCartney 3, Imagined. Now, I have to admit, when we first heard about this project and we talked about it, I was under the impression that these artists involved were all covering songs from McCartney 3, but slowly, as the weeks and weeks passed, it started to become obvious that this was going to be kind of a mixed bag of covers, remixes, sort of reimagined collaborations with Paul's original versions and whatnot. So it's sort of a sort of a mixed bag alternate take on the McCartney three album. So before we actually dissect the album and talk about some of our favorite tracks, songs that we don't like on the album and whatnot, it's probably necessary to go through quickly all of the songs on the album, who performed them, who remixed them, who accompanied Paul's recorded original version and whatnot. So we'll do that now. The album opens and they don't stick to the running order of the tracks as they appeared on Paul McCartney three. So it jumps around a little bit. The album opens McCartney three. Imagine that is opens with uh, find my way featuring Beck. So I kind of read into that as being it's McCartney with Beck's fingerprints all over it. And, Beck also adding his contributions to the track. So that's Find My Way. That opens the album. The Kiss of Venus is next. That's by an artist whose name is Dominic Fike. He is one of the few artists, actually, I had never heard of before this came out. He's an alt hip hop rap singer, songwriter, and multi instrument. And he covers The Kiss of Venus, which was the first single, quote unquote, single to come from McCartney 3 Imagine. Pretty Boys is next. That's by the band Krungbin. They're a terrific trio out of Houston. Laura Lee's the bassist. Mark Spear plays guitar, and the drummer and keyboardist is Donald DJ. Uh, Women and Wives is the fourth tune. St. Vincent remixes Paul's Women and Wives. St. Vincent is Annie Clark, terrific, innovative artist, fabulous guitarist. And uh, in fact, she's about to put out a new album in mid May called Daddy's Home, which is her going to be her sixth main album. She also did an album with David Byrne. Uh, back in 2012, called Love This Giant. Uh, Then after that, Deep Down is a remix by Blood Orange. Blood Orange is Devante Hines, uh, who used to make music as Lightspeed Champion. Then he retired that name, and he's Blood Orange now. And Dev Hines also has worked in uh, films, doing some soundtrack work. I think there's a movie coming out this year called Passing, which he did uh, the music for. Seize the Day is next. Phoebe Bridgers does that. Uh, Actually, it's featuring Phoebe Bridgers. So again, it's Phoebe working with McCartney's track. Phoebe's a terrific artist. She has two solo albums, Punisher, her latest. And she's also recorded with the bands Boy Genius and the Better Oblivion Community Center featured Connor Oberst of Bright Eyes, along with Phoebe Bridgers and Boy Genius. Boy Genius is a trio of Phoebe Bridgers, Julianne Baker, and Lucy Dacus. The seventh track on uh, McCartney 3 Imagined is Sliding. That's a remix by EOB, and EOB is Ed O'Brien, the guitarist or one of the guitarists from Radiohead, put out his first album as EOB last year called Earth. Then we get Long Tailed Winter Bird, uh, a remix by Damon Albarn. Uh, you know Damon Albarn of Blur. He's been mostly active these days as one half of Gorillas. Uh, He was part of The Good, The Bad, and The Queen, a band that also featured Paul Simon on from The Clash and Simon Tong from The Verve. 
and uh, Tony Allen. And then we get Lavatory Lil, covered by Josh Homme. Uh, and he's been in a bunch of bands. Queens of the Stone Age is his band. There's also Eagles of Death Metal. He was a member of Caius. He was part of Them Future Vultures. I'm sorry, Them Crooked Vultures, which also included John Paul Jones and Dave Grohl. And uh, he was in Iggy Pop's band back uh, about five years ago for Iggy Pop's album, Post Pop Depression. And Josh Homme toured with the Screaming Trees as well. When Winter Comes is by Anderson Pock. Actually, it's a remix by Anderson Pock, rapper, singer, songwriter, and producer, uh, and now a member of Silk Sonic with Bruno Mars. They're about to put out their first album and release their first single earlier this year, Leave the Door. The next to last song, well, the last song on the digital uh, version of McCartney 3, Imagined, is Deep Deep Feeling, and that's by 3D RDN. He does the remix that's Robert Del, Robert Del Naha or Del Naja. I don't know how he pronounces it, who also is known as 3D as one of the members of Massive Attack. Uh, and then we don't have this track yet, but when it comes out later in the summer on CD and LP, there'll be a uh, long tailed winter bird remixed by Idris Elba, who I believe is a, an actor and writer and singer songwriter. So those are the tracks uh, 11 on the digital version, 12 on the CD or LP. So let's go first to, to Ken and get his thoughts on these songs. Well, I got to tell you, I've listened to this album probably five or six times now. And I like it more and more with every single listen. Like so many albums, <laughs> even, you know, when it comes to McCartney solo albums, it on the first listen, I don't have a great impression. And then after several listens, then it really grows on you. And I've grown to really like this. Like you, I was a little bit perplexed <laughs> as to what this, the concept of this album was going to be. I really did think it was going to be all cover versions. But from watching the first two interviews that Paul gave, the one with um, Ed O'Brien and with St. Vincent, it became apparent that this was a very free-form experiment for these artists to do whatever they wanted to do with the songs. If they wanted to cover it themselves, fine. If they want to use any of the tracks from McCartney's recordings of these songs, they could do it. They could just use his vocals if they want to. They could use his drum tracks. They could do whatever they wanted to do. And that's what I like most about this whole concept. You don't really know what to expect with each, but at the same time, if there's an artist in here that you happen to like a lot, like, I don't know all of Beck's catalog, but I do like what I've heard from him, but I was kind of hoping maybe there'd be a duet or something where you would at least hear Beck's voice, and instead it's more what he brings to the backing tracks behind Paul's voice. And, you know, I happen to like that particular track and what he did with it. But overall, there's, uh, you know, I like the approaches of what was taken here. And, um, you know, I don't know if you want me to mention which ones I like the most, but overall, yeah. I, 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 yeah, definitely the biggest highlights for me have to be, well, the first three, well, let me see here, five, six tracks in a row. I love a lot. But um, The Kiss of Venus, which was the first one leaked out with the video, which Paul makes a cameo at the end, I like what Dominic Fike did with it. He turned it into like, like an R&B feel, really, and adding all these new words about reading the paper which I guess was the New York Times. They did that for Alan, by the way, mm -hmm. just to make him feel good. <laughs> but um, I like that approach. It was something different. When you, when you give a very different arrangement to a song, it shows effort instead of just trying to copy the exact same arrangement. And I tend to favor those kind of covers, if you will, of, of songs like these. And I really like The Kiss of Venus. I like what Beck did with Find My Way. But probably the, the two biggest highlights for me, at least right now anyway, would be what was done with Pretty Boys. How do you pronounce the band again, Darren? Crumbin. Crumbin. Okay. Now, some people like this approach, and we've seen this done countless times in music, where you lift a particular line from a song and you keep repeating it over and over with a backing track. And in this case, it was like a dance track and it really grooves very well. I love the bass playing on it. And you lift lines like, uh, you can look, but you better not touch, that kind of thing, over and over. And it's all where you place it. And it has a whole different feel from 
Paul's version of Pretty Boys. And, you know, I like this approach, completely different from the version that Paul did on McCartney 3. You know, I'm sure there are some people who don't go for that kind of thing. But um, I just think that the way that this was um, approached was was really interesting. And I like Women and Wives a lot. Um, There, St. Vincent used Paul's vocals and kind of had a bit of a gospel feel with the, the, the backing vocals as well. Deep Down, I liked a lot. You know, I just everything really sees the day. Just because I love the song so much, I love this recording of it. The very quiet, tender vocals, if you will, uh, softer vocals of Phoebe Bridgers, it it works this way. I kind of wish that there'd be a more edgier version of Seize the Day, (laughs) Uh, something that rocks a bit, even though it's a mid-tempo song. Sliden was like one of the few disappointments. I mean, I love the song, but all that Ed O'Brien seemed to do is just speed up the track. And um, I don't think that much effort was put in behind that. I could be wrong. It's still a great song, and I love the edginess of it. But I didn't see that much effort there. Um, I love what uh, was done with Long-Tailed Winter Bird. And it's got this uh, laid-back, moody feel to it. And also, it's kind of interesting when you jump right in and use Paul's recordings as it was on the album with his drumming and everything. And it's like, you're going right back to the album. And then what Damon was adding to it with the, with the uh, backing tracks later. Yeah. There's a nice moodiness to it. You know, I like what he did there. Lavatory Lil. I really need to listen to more. It just Lavatory Lil is a song that's kind of disappointing for me from the McCartney three album, only because I feel like it should have been done by a full band doing it. It needs to rock out, and it sounds more like a demo. Even you know McCartney's version of it sounds demo-ish. Maybe some people find that appealing. But I kind of feel like what Josh Homme did was kind of similar in that regard. But maybe I should give it more of a chance. Anderson Pack. at first, I really thought this does not work. <laughs> um, speeding up when winter comes. Well, yeah, speeding up a little bit, but then adding drums to it. It works so well as a folk song, as an acoustic guitar song, the kind of stuff you you crave from Paul, vintage McCartney sound. And I've gotten I've gotten used to it now. It has kind of a cocktail lounge feel to it. (laughs) And um, I like it. You know, I'm not going to say I like any of these versions more than Paul's version. But um, whenever I do see something that requires some effort behind it, then, then I appreciate that, that kind of effort. And then you never know if a different audience who may not be the biggest McCartney fans might hear these songs and like them more the way it's done here. And with Deep Deep Feeling, uh, I was kind of surprised at the fact that it went on for over 11 minutes and yet I wasn't bored with it. <laughs> and uh, I especially like the fact that they knew enough to mix in the backing tracks of Temporary Secretary in there briefly. Yeah. I thought that was really cool what was done there. But, you know, overall, I I do like these kind of things. I wish that Paul would do this more often. I wish the solo Beatles catalog in general was done like this. Getting contemporary artists to put their own stamp or some kind of influence on these songs. And maybe a younger audience might prefer what they're doing with it. So that's part of the benefit in doing these kind of things. You got to separate yourself from the fact that, in my case, when it comes to the Beatles and their solo music, I'm always going to prefer their recordings of them. But yet I have loved many, many cover versions of their songs, group and solo. And um, I'm finding, at least in my particular case, as I've gotten older, that I've appreciated more cover versions and something more like this. Like I said in our last show, certain magazines have put out CDs of cover versions of Beatles and solo stuff. And a lot of that's new artists of today. And um, they do their own arrangements. And some of them I'm not crazy about. And others I grow to like. And um, yeah, so overall, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with this. And I have a feeling that as I listen even more, I'm going to like it even more. So, yeah, yeah that's my general okay. impression of the whole thing. <laughs> All right, so McCartney 3 Imagined gets the Ken Michaels thumbs up. Alan, your thoughts? 
Yeah, and it gets uh, a modified thumbs up from me. <laughs> but I think before you know, before I, I talk about the songs, um, I just want to sort of look at it as a commercial endeavor. And as a commercial endeavor, it's brilliant. First of all, you know, if you you figure, you know, you're you're Paul McCartney, you've written all these songs, you own all your publishing, you want people to do covers, but. In this case, he's not sort of waiting around for people to do covers. He has a project that involves people doing covers. And who did he get to do the covers? He got, you know, a lot of pretty much cutting edge younger artists who were going to appeal to a lot of people who probably didn't hear McCartney 3 in his version because to them he's sort of, you know, dad's music. And, uh, and and so that in itself was a brilliant move. A second brilliant move commercially is that, okay, he announced that the physical forms were going to come out on July 23rd. And probably all of us obsessive collectors ordered both the vinyl and the CD and possibly some colored vinyl. I didn't do colored vinyl for this one because, it, you know, I looked at it as, okay, it's, it's, it's an official Paul project, but it is an album of, you know, largely covers. You, it was from the announcement originally, you couldn't tell how much were going to be covers and how much were going to be remixes, but it didn't seem like, you know, this is something I want to have lots of colored vinyl. Uh, so I just have the, the standard vinyl and the CD, but for all of us obsessives, there was no possibility that we were going to wait three months after the download version was released to hear the stuff. And yeah, you can do it on Spotify, I suppose. But I mean, I just went to iTunes and downloaded the album, you know, bought another copy. So I've, I've now bought three of them. That's why I say commercially, it's brilliant. So you've got, you know, not only at least three sales, from the obsessives, but you have a whole audience that probably would never have heard these songs at all, who might hear them now because artists who mean something to them are doing them. So onto the artists who mean something to them. For geezers like me, um, well, although I, I, I did know a number of these artists, I know St. Vincent, I know Damon Albarn, uh, you know, they're, they're not totally, I'm not totally in the dark about this stuff, but generally speaking, I thought it was really kind of a good sampler of a lot of music that's out there today that younger people are listening to, but, you know, it sort of takes it puts it in a way in my ball field by having it be McCartney songs, you know, and especially since McCartney three was an album that I liked, you know, mostly it kind of was a, a good, a good way of sort of introducing all these artists to people of, I think our generation, it does remind me slightly of, you know, I mean, musically, it doesn't remind me of this at all, but the move reminds me slightly of Thrillington in the sense that, you know, Paul finished Ram and he wanted someone to cover it orchestrally. And he sort of just had it done. He commissioned it. It was recorded in 71. It wasn't released until 77. Um, he and Linda did a lot before the album was made to try and create a myth of Percy Thrillington. You know, they took out little ads in papers uh, about you know, Thrillington. And I don't know if you, if you heard the new Thrillington, you know, and it wasn't even out yet. It wasn't even recorded yet. They were just sort of trying to create a, a buzz about this non-existent conductor. I guess he was existent in, in the sense that it was Richard Hewson and you know, that was interesting, too, because Richard Hewson was the one who did the orchestration for Long and Winding Road that upset him so much. And yet he hired him to do this whole album and completely gave him, you know, freedom of arranging it however he wanted, which I guess he did with these people, too. So with, uh, you know... Find my way, uh, you know, I, I, I like Beck. I think Beck is a very... Um, inventive guy. I was kind of surprised that 
he used Paul's vocals. The vocals sounds a little more processed to me in the Beck version than they did in Paul's version. But the interesting stuff is, is really the stuff that Beck put all around it. And there are certain things in common that run through the album. And one is an awful lot of percussion. Um, it's very, I guess, dancey, you might say, because that, that heavy percussion is really sort of a hallmark of, of, of dance music now. And that I have mixed feelings about, although I'm kind of interested in the different ways people use percussion. I mean, the heavy beat is one thing, but there's there's a lot of, you know, different kinds of sort of lighter tactile percussion, and that varies from person to person. Um, also, electronics use this percussion. Uh, you know, just sort of speaking generally all through the thing, there's a lot of it in Damon Al uh, Albarn's track and, uh, you know, really, really in almost everything. And that also, because they're doing so much electronic stuff, there's kind of a haze around a lot of these tracks where, you know, you're kind of not entirely sure what instrument it is because it is just kind of, you know, hazy and atmospheric and, uh, and, and, and dark in a way. But the songs, that, the, the ones that I think work the best were Women and Wives. I mean, I, I like St. Vincent. I like her as a guitarist, and she has a pretty good solo in here. I like what she did with the sort of between-the-lines background vocals. And, uh, you know, it's it's just a, a very inventive arrangement and sort of a dreamy backdrop, um, interesting drums and bass. Uh, and, I, and I do like to sort of, you know, soulful backing vocals that she puts in there. Deep down, Blood Orange. I love that. It's kind of, you know, because it kind of almost edges into my other world, the classical thing, you know, because it's it's like little choral settings of some of these verses. And they're really beautifully done. Um, but the one that I really like the best is Phoebe Bridger's Seize the Day. And like Ken, I think it might be partly because I like the song a lot. It, it really is one of the best songs on McCartney 3, but I think it really works with a female vocal. And I, I think she just does an incredible job with it. A uh, little bit of psychedelia in there, a uh, flange effect on the guitar, lots of really nice details. That one I have gone back to over and over and over after these several times I listened to the album. That was the one I kept going back to. Sliding, you know, the thing I, I liked about Ed O'Brien's version of Sliding is that Sliding was a kind of metal track, you know, it, it's, it, it hints towards this kind of, you know, very heavy, grungy metal sound. And Ed O'Brien did it more. It's like, it's like if Paul did his, uh, you know, grungy sound on, you know, nine and a half, he turns it up to 11, you know. So that works in the sense that I think he's getting closer to what Paul intended the song to be. Whereas when winter comes, I had absolutely the opposite reaction um, to Ken, because to me, it didn't do what the song wants to do. To me, it's, you know, the way Paul did it, I think is just perfect. It's like, I think Ken used the word folksy. That's about right. It's, it's very sort of, you know, country life and, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it, it the tempo Paul takes it is great. I, I didn't really think of this one as so much as faster as, you know, the drums come in and there's all these, you know, peppy drum sound, continuous, and, you know, just pushing forward. And this is not a pushing forward song. This is a lean back and look at those foxes getting into the, you know, the chickens area song. You know, it's, it's a particular kind of picture that's being painted of this very sort of bu bucolic view. And it's like suddenly they've come in and put a bunch of skyscrapers and, you know, bright reds and all that it, to me didn't work but uh let's see the last one um deep deep feeling i kind of liked um just because i guess you know when we heard about mccartney 3 coming out and i think in a couple of early press releases they mentioned it being experimental and to me 
in the McCartney series, the most experimental one was McCartney two. And so I expected more of, you know, going several, you know, a couple of decades beyond McCartney two, four decades beyond McCartney two with experimentation. And so I expected it to be something like deep, deep feeling on imagined and McCartney three wasn't, but this is. And then, you know, when I heard that, it's like, you know, over 11, it's 11 and a half minutes almost. And it's very sectional. It stops and goes, does all kinds of things. And when I was thinking of it as like, okay, this is kind of what I expected for McCartney three in the first place. Then sort of looking back over a lot of the other tracks, I, I began to think, you know, in a way, the whole album is more like what I expected McCartney 3 to be. Obviously, not the ones with female vocals. I expected it all to be Paul vocals. But I, I think I expected more experimentation. And that's what this album offers as a whole. So there it is. One big, long-winded overview. <laughs> so that also gets the Alan Cozen thumbs up. I give it a thumbs up from you. Mm -hmm. It sounded like you're pretty like most everything on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's funny. My thoughts almost exactly mirror both you guys kind of combined. While I was listening to this album, I, I sort, of, sort of started thinking, you know, this is the latest in the series of side projects that Paul has released through his career, starting, I guess, with Rillington. But once Paul started to embrace um, ambient music, techno, uh, dance stuff, Namely, the three Fireman albums, the Liverpool Sound Collage album, and uh, the one Twin Freaks album. Mm. I thought, you know, this really is sort of an extension of that part of McCartney's career, that part of his, uh, his music. These side projects that he would put out uh, that musically were pretty much unlike the main albums. You know, it would give an opportunity for McCartney to you know, to branch out into different areas that you wouldn't normally expect him to. Uh, it sort of played to me a little bit like Paul going back into that experimental direction. <laughs> but this time he did, uh, he let other people do the majority of the work for him. And like uh, Alan said at the beginning of his thoughts, it is a, a great advertisement for the album from McCartney 3, the original. It's a great advertisement for Paul's current music in general introducing it or reintroducing it to uh, a younger audience. And at the same time, for the older folks, you're getting exposed to the likes of St. Vincent and Anderson Pock and uh, Phoebe Bridgers, etc. Artists that many people might not ever really get a chance to, uh, to get into. So, you know, it's got the multiple purposes, this album. And again, it reminded me of those those side projects that Paul would put out scattered throughout the year. He could even maybe even throw his classical albums in there into this grouping of the side projects uh, that Paul would scatter throughout his career. I mean, look at 1987 Flowers and, and then after that live album, the abridged live album, Tripping the Live Fantastic Highlights. And then you get the unplugged live album. Then along comes the Fireman. Then along comes a classical album. Then off the ground. Then another Fireman album, another classical album, blah, blah, blah. And it went on for a while like that. And these sort of side detour projects for Paul seem to have quieted down in recent years. So when I was listening to this, I thought, you know what? This is the latest one, the latest Twin Freaks album, the latest Thrillington, the latest Ocean's Kingdom. So as for tracks that I like, I won't go through every single song here um and, and in many instances my opinions almost mirror what the two of you said my favorite track on the album is probably uh pretty boys yeah which, <laughs> which features krung bin i've always been intrigued by krung bin they're a trio out of houston you don't expect them to be sort of a little experimental a little um uh cerebral i don't know maybe because when i hear from from they're from texas you expect you know <laughs> you know america something rootsy but the what they do tends to be heady uh tends to bring in elements of world music and i like what they did they turned pretty boys into just sort of like a kind of trip hop kind of thing i love the groove bass player laura lee to give her plug her nice groove 
I really like guitarist Mark Spears playing. It reminded me a lot of Andy Summers and the stuff that he would do with the police. So the Pretty Boy, Pretty Boys featuring Krungbun is probably my favorite track on the album. I'd say that after that, I was very intrigued by Deep Deep Feeling by 3D RDN, his remix. At 11 and a half minutes in length, though, it was probably a little too long. Uh, but like you pointed out, Ken, I really love the way he weaved Temporary Secretary into his remix of Deep, Deep Feeling. I thought that showed uh, that, you know, he kind of knew the material he was working with and he knew the artist that he was working with. That sounded to me like a song that might have been an outtake from Liverpool Sound Collage, Deep, Deep Feeling. Uh, just kind of just was out there. It meandered in parts. It drew you back in. It was all over the map. And, you know, a lot of times Liverpool sound collage, when I'd listen to that, would be like, whoa, <laughs> wow, that's crazy. That's crazy in a good way. Uh, yeah. So I like Deep Deep Feeling, another highlight for me. Uh, I like what uh, St. Vincent did with her remix of, of Women and Wives. I was actually I was a little disappointed with it only because I thought I was expecting more from what she would do. Uh, but uh, I agree with what um, Alan said in pointing out you could clearly hear her guitar added on to uh, you know the basic track of McCartney's. I kind of felt the same way about the opening tune "Find My Way" featuring Beck. I thought Beck would do a little more than he. Beck seems to have played it safe. With uh, with what you know, what he added to find my way. So find my way, featuring Beck and the St. Vincent remix of Women and Wives were solid. I enjoyed them, but I kind of was expecting more. I, I'm going to sound old here. I don't get Dominic Fike, and I understand that this is another generation. He's a young hip hop rap singer songwriter, multi instrumentalist, and. There was not. There's nothing wrong with the Kiss of Venus. It's just not the type of thing that I gravitate to, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the little uh, dots and dashes and touches and that always kind of left me a little cold. Phoebe Bridges track, pretty much what I expect Phoebe Bridges to do. Phoebe taking McCartney sees the day. Uh, I love the fact that it, uh, it, it's what she does, you know, the cerebral, dreamy type material. I was a bit disappointed with EOB's remix of Sliding. Again, another case where it didn't go anywhere. It seemed like it was it wanted to be like a Radiohead remix. It was trying very hard to do that. Again, not a not a bomb, not a failure of a track, just one that just ultimately didn't go anywhere. And I guess maybe it could also be lumped in with what I thought of St. Vincent's track and Beck's track that I was expecting more from EOB. And uh, let's see, which, which other one here should I uh, single out? Uh, I mentioned Krung, Ben, Dominic Fike, Beck. I got every, all of them here. The Damon Albarn remix of Long-Tailed Winter Bird was solid. I can tell it's got Damon Albarn's fingerprints all over it. If you know any of his work with Gorillaz, and uh, and even Blur, it just I'm listening to it going, this is definitely Dave. Dave. Uh, he created a trance-like vibe that to some ears might not go anywhere. Uh, and to other ears is a cool vibe. I kind of felt like it was a pretty cool take on Long-Tailed long Winter Bird. Two tracks I really didn't like um, was Josh Homme's cover of Lavatory Lil. Just didn't like it. Simple. That's it. Period. Did nothing for me. And uh, I was not crazy with the remix from Blood Orange of Deep Down. I liked Anderson Pock's remix of uh, When Winter Comes. But again, that one was sort of just there. Um, so my thoughts, uh, I think the album is a is a necessary release. Uh, when I say necessary, I see a lot of people. Uh, knocking the album before they heard it or some criticizing it on one hearing on only one hearing on Facebook. You know, I think all of that criticism is unfair. Uh, I think the album definitely has a has a role in McCartney's catalog and uh, is a really clever, innovative way of giving 
a late period album by a veteran rock artist, another look and another, you know, another, um, what's another way I'm, what I'm looking for, another angle for an album by somebody who's almost 80, who's been making music forever, you know, but yet here we are yet again, he does something that is somewhat in step with the times. So, um, I don't know how many times I'll put it on my turntable or CD player, but I'd rather have it than not. And, you know, I had to give it a, from a zero to a 10 with 10 being Abbey road. And, uh, I, I would say I would give it a five, I think in general, five to, it could be five to, you know, and depending on my mood, I, if I'm in the mood for some contemporary stuff, I might say nah, six or seven, or if I'm strictly in the mood of wanting to listen to the original McCartney three, I might, you know, drop my grade a little bit. But um, if you like Paul, especially if you like McCartney three, I think this is, you know, I think it's a close to a must have just to get the full experience of what Paul McCartney's music during a pandemic is all about. (laughs) Because if there was no pandemic, I think it's safe to say there probably wouldn't be a McCartney three. And uh, there definitely wouldn't then be a McCartney 3 imagined. Well, I think that um, this idea is is really brilliant. And from what I understand, I think it was in one of those interviews, probably with Ed O'Brien, this was something that his manager came up with as an idea. Uh, I don't really know. It's kind of interesting. Some of these artists, or maybe all of them, might have been given all these tracks from McCartney 3 before the album even came out. You know, they they may have heard this stuff before it was officially released, because let's face it, it's only four months, you know, right. less than four months since this album's come out. And this is pretty quick for this to be made. So, you know, I just love I love the no, fact that that he's working with contemporary artists of today and them putting their spin on it. And you're always going to have older fans who are. I don't want to use the word conservative, but I think, you know, they're so used to a certain style, a certain sound. Nothing can compare to Paul's recordings of his songs. They're not going to be as open minded to hearing new artists of today or relatively new artists, you know, doing their own arrangements or adding whatever they want to 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 his music. But I think that it's really something that I applaud Paul for because He gets a lot of heat for trying to be contemporary, for hooking up with current producers, for teaming up with a Kanye West or something like that. But I think it's very smart to do that, because if you do work with some of these people, you might get some of their audience to listen to what you're doing. And it could work the other way, too. It's cross promotion. It's very smart. But at the same time, you're always going to have those fans out there that will reject whenever Paul tries to do this kind of thing. Like, you know, in the news, I just mentioned that, you know, Paul is, was just in the studio with Andrew Watt and you're looking at um, his credentials there. And uh, you know, one of the artists that he, that he's worked with is Justin Bieber. Now you tell a lot of fans of Paul's he's working with the producer for Justin Bieber and they're going to roll their eyes. You know, why are you doing something like that? But I think it's important to work with a lot of different people, whether they're new artists, whether they're veteran artists. You know, I think that's how you grow, even, you know, at the age of 78 (laughs) that Paul is right now. Working with different people is is a good thing. This is a very different approach, though, because it's not like he's in the studio with these people. I kind of wish that he would write with someone like Beck, you know or any of these artists that are on this compilation, that's a whole different category than just handing these people your recordings and you do what you want with it or cover them whichever way you want to. But I find this kind of thing interesting. And if it manages to get some younger fans to investigate McCartney three or McCartney's catalog, then I'm totally for it. Yeah. I think it's the, it's the mark of a true artist that at this point in Paul's career, He's still pushing the envelope. He's still wanting to learn, wanting to experiment, wanting to be contemporary and not rehashing, you know, same old, same old. There were so many artists and bands that I like and I won't knock them. I won't uh, mention them here. 
that aggravate me because they're locked in as oldies acts now. And it seems like they want that, want it that way. You know, maybe they're, you know, now have become just solely a live band and haven't released new music in decades. I, I'll never stop loving these artists because they're my favorites and I grew up listening to them. But kind of that attitude of, well, no one's going to listen or buy my new music. So what's the point? The point is that you're an artist and that this is what you do. And there are still some hardcore fans out there that are interested in what you might cook up in 2021 just like we were interested in you know the live album you put out in 1979 and mccartney i think stays relevant and cutting edge even if some of his experiments fail or stumble he's still out there doing that instead of you know instead of i don't know releasing the same album every five years or not even putting out new music and just touring every so often um so and he did this project uh, and he didn't really break a sweat because other people did the work for him. Mm. You know, with the attitude of, I just made this new music. I'm Paul McCartney. I was in the Beatles. This is what I can do at age 70. What'd you say? 78. 78. Okay. 70. This is what I do. And what can you do with it here? What do you hear in these songs? Why don't you like play around with this and turn it into something that's your own? I think it's a good idea. It's a fresh idea and good for Paul. More power to him. And I'm glad he did this this project. Mm. You know, it's interesting. We mentioned before that there's this tribute album coming out on Ram called Ram On. And there you have two completely different approaches in tributes. Because this Ram On tribute, while most of the artists are independent artists who, who are not household names, the arrangements of the songs for Ram are as close as possible to what Paul did on the album. And here with this, it's like, do what you will, do whatever arrangement you want, you know, and it, you couldn't find two completely different approaches to Paul's music. I wonder yeah, what the royalty situation, the performance royalty situation with this is, because if they're using the raw materials from Paul's recordings overlaid with their own, to some degree, it's still a Paul McCartney recording. So is, is it, does he get the performance royalties for say, find my way because it's, it's his vocal or I, I'm just sort of curious about that. I, I know none of us know the answer, but just an interesting question to me. Yeah. Someone um, who knows this kind of thing about performance royalties and all, mm. please contact us. I know you mentioned, uh, Ken, that this was probably the type of project that was in the planning stages, even even as Paul was doing the finishing touches on his album. And long before McCartney 3 was ever released, the seeds had been planted for McCartney 3 Imagined. And I think that was the case. Somebody that I know at, uh, at the record company avoided detail, but hinted to back. And I guess it was... I think it was, it was around, it was actually right before McCartney 3 came out, I believe. But yeah, yeah, I remember the conversation because it was it was went right smack in the middle of my COVID adventures in December. Um, he had alluded to the fact that, you know, I had joked with him about all of the colored vinyl that was coming out of McCartney 3. And he sort of alluded to the fact of it all being just a part of this bigger plan, this bigger thing. That was going to stretch through. I I think he made it sound like all of 2020. Um, so you know the whole project I think was was pre sort of pre laid out and and you know this this album is not something that was whipped up quickly. It was something that was probably being worked on uh, you know well er, earlier in 2020. 2020. I mean, mm -hmm. kind of all the years seem the same. You know, there was actually, now that I think about it, I, I totally forgot about it until you brought up, you know, this this uh, discussion that you had uh, with someone at the label. As part of the promotion for McCartney 3, do you remember he was doing these billboards in various cities with a page of the sheet music from each of the songs right. and encouraging people to record 
uh, a cover version of, of the song before the album even came out. So obviously it was sort of limited to people who could read the music. Um, but I think a few people actually did post things on YouTube that were covers of, of some of these songs. So it's, it's, uh, it's not exactly what this is, but it's kind of funny that that was in the air back then before the album came out. And there's the things we said today. Look at the McCartney three imagined album. Another look, a collection of remixes and covers and whatnot of Paul's McCartney three album. And I think that pretty much uh, brings things to a close for this things we said today. So uh, let's go around the horn and uh, share our contact information, starting with Ken. Okay, if you want to get in contact with me, the best way to do so is by email at everylittlething at att.net. My YouTube channel has been pretty busy of late. I've been doing a lot of interviews, as I mentioned before. Denny Sywell, the former drummer of Wings, who also played on the Ram album, and Fernando Perdomo, those two are the co-producers of the forthcoming tribute to Ram called Ram On, due out May 14th. I interviewed both of them separately on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. Also, <laughs> I had the thrill of talking to uh, someone who was a huge part of the hits of the early 60s, and that's Bobby Rydell. I talked to him about his career and also his slight uh, encounter. I shouldn't say slight. He had an encounter with the Beatles, and he also covered A World Without Love uh, around the same time that Peter and Gordon had a hit with it. So I discussed his entire career and some of the hits that he had. That was such a fun conversation. If you're a fan of his, what a great voice he has had through the years and uh, so poised at a very young age to be a star as he was. We even talked about when he was in Bye Bye Birdie, the film. Um, in addition to that, I also interviewed Gabe Dixon, who played the keyboards on Paul's Driving Rain album, and uh, more recently, Sam Wiles of the podcast Paul or Nothing. It's a solo McCartney podcast discussing whether or not Paul was lost in the 80s as an artist between the Tug of War album and Flowers in the Dirt. Okay, uh, I'm sure that you've seen from time to time this conversation come up in in podcast shows and discussions about the solo careers of the Beatles and what was going on with Paul after tug of war and whether or not his music was up to par up until flowers in the dirt. So we have uh, a great discussion about that. That's all at Ken Michaels radio. My other uh, podcast show, talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next show will be Monday and that's April the 26th at 9 PM Eastern on our Facebook page. Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We'll be talking about the different greatest hits and compilations of George Harrison's solo career. As I said, that's next Monday. And don't forget, there's always my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Beatles trivia every single week. Great prizes to be won. And uh, lots of great interviews on the website as well. And I think that just about covers it. Okay, Alan, you're up. Okay, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or at Alan Cozen Remixed. I was anticipating uh, McCartney 3 Imagined when I created that page. So, uh, And you can also reach all of us by email at thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com. That's thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com gmail.com we have a twitter feed which is at things we said fab um, and we have two facebook pages for the group one is things we said today beatles radio fans and the other one is just things we said today the shows get posted on all of those you can also find them on podbean and youtube and uh, itunes and um, that's that all right and uh as for me, you could listen to WFUV if you're in the New York metropolitan area. We're at 90.7 FM. And if you still like flipping to HD, we're on 90.7 FM HD2. Uh, also, you can uh, stream us at WFUV.org and uh, download our app, listen to us on our app. 
And if you have a smart speaker, you could say, and I know nothing about these smart speakers except that uh, my wife's clock radio will occasionally talk to me without being prompted, and it freaks me out. But if you have a, um, uh, a smart speaker, you can ask it to play WFUV. And I'm on the air Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights starting at 10 p.m., and you can listen on Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m., Saturday afternoons. And if you want to contact me at WFUV, send me an email. The address is Darren DeVivo, or D DeVivo actually is shorter and just as good. D DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook. I've got two pages. You could send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo, or like or follow, or whatever Facebook is referring to it this month. Uh, my other page, which is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. Uh, and that's a great way to keep in touch with what I'm up to. And uh, I think that just about wraps things up. So for Ken Michaels and for Alan Kozan, I'm Darren DeVivo. We will see you uh, soon. I think we got our plan to take a look at the reissue of John Lennon Plastic Ono Band. Uh, hopefully nothing changes with that. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.